are thankful that once again God has blessed us with another opportunity to come out here and to worship Him in spirit and in truth. We're so thankful that each of you have come out here tonight. I can't think of any better way to ever spend uh, my evenings than to be with my brothers and sisters in Christ. And so thankful that we are here on this Lord's Day, especially, we can come together to, to feast upon God's Word. And hopefully we'll go away from here tonight uh, having been edified and, and uplifted uh, by the Word of God. Uh, this, this morning we began a series of lessons, and I want to continue with that series tonight. Before I get into that series, I want to read uh, some scriptures here that we find here on the board in, in Judges chapter 2 to kind of uh, get our minds on the direction I want to go in this evening. In Judges chapter 2, uh, the book here is picking up in, in this chapter, it actually picks up with uh, the death of Joshua here in this chapter here toward where we're getting ready to read. He has passed away uh, and is telling us pretty briefly here what happens as a result of the godly generation that passes on. And it says in Judges chapter 2 and verse 10, When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them uh, who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them. And they bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. The Bible gives us uh, a very, uh, very detailed history when it comes to uh, how people... Uh, engaged in life in, in respect to God. It tells us about the times when people were serving God uh, faithfully and the blessings they had bestowed upon them as a result. And it tells us about the times when people failed to serve God acceptably. Judges chapter 2, verse 10 through 12 is one of those times we read about uh, one of those sad moments in time where we find a, a generation that says you grew up that didn't know God. And the end result of that was that they did evil on the side of the Lord and they found themselves uh, on the judgment side uh, of God. That is, uh, they were going to find themselves punished for their disobedience to God. His anger was aroused and as he uh, was provoked to anger, it says at the end of verse 12. This morning we began a series of lessons on the topic of evolution versus God. Evolution or God. It's not going to continue of that discussion. Of all the different things that, that the devil could use, uh, at, at all the tools that he has at his disposal, the various philosophies that he could throw at us, the various different perversions of religion and religions that are out there, uh, among these tools is the tool of evolution that the devil can use, as we learned this morning, is a tool that denies God. It is a tool that uh, denies the book of Genesis and thus denies everything that is said thereafter. And one of the things we learned this morning is that the, the topic uh, and teaching of evolution is something that is so widespread. When we look at it, it's taught in our schools, it's taught in media, it, it's taught in, in movies, it's taught just about anywhere you look. Because the message of evolution has reached such a wide-ranging audience, we look around at the society we live today and we see that we are a society that is going towards a direction much like what we just read about in Judges chapter 2. That is to say that as we have more and more of our young people growing up, learning about evolution and it being taught to them as a fact, being taught to them at all, but being taught to them as a fact, and nothing said to them about God. And fewer and fewer people being interested in, in God in, in believing in the Bible. It is no surprise, yet it is a sad surprise, you might say, a sad uh, result, that we find ourselves on the, on the move towards a generation that does not know God. And so it is important that we uh, fight back against such a, a, an attack on our faith such an attack on God's Word. And so tonight we want to continue our thought on evolution uh, or God. And tonight what I want to do, we use this morning kind of as an, as an introduction. It's not, it's somewhat of a continuation of an introduction. But this evening I want to lay uh, the groundwork for why, uh, more so than just what I just said, as to why we need to talk about uh, evolution or God. And let me just say this too for a moment. 
the word evolution itself, that word is not a bad word. There's no, we, there actually is a use for that word, uh, and it doesn't mean the, the way we're using it here in this lesson, the way Darwin used it when we talked about the book he wrote on, on the origin of species or Richard Dawkins or other individuals that are uh, anti-God and pro-evolution. Evolution, uh, in, a, in, a simple form, in a simple way of using it, just means something that's changing. Cars evolve. You, you take a look at, you know, if you're a car aficionado, you know if you go back uh, 20, 30 years and you look at maybe, say, a Chevy pickup truck uh, from 30 years ago to now, you know that it, the, the body style on it continues to evolve and get more rounded and more smooth and, and things like that. Uh, but it's still a Chevy truck. This morning, I was joking with Mason after, after service. Sorry for putting me on the spot here. But this morning, I, I told him that, that he was evolving into a tall person. And, uh, but you know, all of our children do that. They start out small. You might say they change, they grow up, and they get taller, but they're still the same person. They're still the same kind of, of uh, creation. They're still a human, and they're still that same person. That's microevolution uh, to some extent. We'll talk more about that in Lesson 3. But when we're talking about evolution that, that denies God, we're talking about evolution where it's said, not that, not that a child can grow up from being a, a short uh, in, a, adolescent to a, to a tall individual, but that child grows up and changes into some other form of uh, a creature. Now, I'm not talking about when they become teenagers either. <laughs> we're, talking about, we're talking about you take a dog and you get a duck out of it or something like that. I was watching a video this evening, and I may share this video with you in the next lesson. And it was uh, evolution in 40 seconds. It was a video about 4 billion years of evolution in 40 seconds is what the video was called. And the video started out with a sail. And then, it, and then it morphed into something else. I don't remember what it was. But then it eventually became a fish. Eventually it became a fish that crawled on the land. That, that, that animal that crawled on the land went over to a tree and climbed the tree became a monkey. And then eventually the monkey came down out of the tree and it was a person. And that... That's the kind of evolution, that's the evolution we're talking about that denies that God created us exactly as we are now, that everything that is here now is, as far as a species, a, a duck's always been a duck, a chicken has always been a chicken, a dog's always been a dog, a human has always been a human, and a monkey's always been a monkey, and a monkey didn't turn into a human. Uh, that's what we're talking about here tonight in and, and, and this series of lessons. And if we don't understand what evolution is, is teaching, and we don't understand what the truth is in the Bible about, about creation, we deny the very foundation of this book we call the Bible, and everything written after that is suspect, is taken into question. And so we cannot say, well, I don't believe that Genesis is, it said, it means what it says, and if you say that, well then, where do you stop? Do you say that chapter 6 doesn't, didn't really happen? The flood wasn't universal. Do we say that Jesus didn't really come into the world and, and die on the cross? Where do you put the stopping point? Well, there is no. Once you open the door to compromise, there's no stop. And so I want to talk about tonight evolution uh, or God and understand why we're having this topic. And I believe that there's four good reasons tonight we're going to look at. And that is evolution, as I said, denies God. And I want to show you some evidence of that here in just a moment. Secondly, I want us to understand that we need to know about this because we are told in 1 Peter 3.15 that we must always be ready to give a, a, an answer for the, if anyone that asks us a reason of the hope that is in us with meekness and fear. We need to be ready. We're not going to be ready to talk to somebody about doctrinal error or somebody that talks to us about uh, denying whether God exists or not if we don't study uh, and, and prepare. That's what these lessons are about. Thirdly, we don't want to be like that generation we read about a few moments ago and have a generation that grows up that doesn't know God. And so our children need to remember their creator. And then fourthly, we, we, want, we want everyone to come to the Lord and know the truth. Then they are evolutionists, the atheists. They have a soul, and God wants them to be saved. And so those are the points we want to look at tonight. How do we know evolution denies God? Let's take a look at some of the things that people say. This is an article that came uh, that was in 2004, and it's the question on the article is, can an evolutionist believe in God? That's the question. And we've kind of answered that a little bit this morning, but there is those that want to try to mesh creation and evolution together and say, well, yeah, I can believe in God. God just got things started, uh, and then he just allowed evolution to, to uh, finish the course, per se. 
This article says, all things considered, it is not surprising that many people viewed evolutionary theory as incompatible with religious belief. Nonetheless, although some Christians still reject the theory of evolution, many more have accommodated their religious beliefs to it. Now, I want to stop right there and focus in on that phrase. Notice what it says there. Many people that are religious have accommodated their religious beliefs to it. In other words, they've said, instead of standing their ground, holding fast, the faithful word as we have been taught, there are individuals out there that said, I'm going to budge, I want to, I'm going to compromise, and I'm going to try to blend the two together, and I'm going to accommodate my beliefs. Anytime we accommodate one belief, one verse of the Bible, so that it will fit something that is against God, we've compromised the rest of the Bible too. We've compromised everything. We must not ever find ourselves in such a situation. It, it boggles my mind that, that an individual could write that and think that that's okay, that we should accommodate our religious beliefs. To the contrary, the Bible teaches us about, about accommodating our lives to match the way that God wants us to live. God wants to change us to serve Him. And so we must accommodate the lives that we live to, to, to uh, suit the Lord. And then it says the core of the theory, of, uh, the core of the theory, the idea that species have changed over time and diverged from common ancestors, is only incompatible with a literal interpretation of the creation stories in Genesis. Anyone willing to accept that the biblical stories are metaphorical could maintain that God created life through the process of evolution. Furthermore, as we shall see, there are still many mysteries. Uh, that believers can uh, claim and uh, demonstrate the existence of God. In light of these considerations, it would appear that evolutionary theory does not necessarily clash with belief in God. This fits with the more general idea that science and religion are separate and non-overlapping domains, and therefore uh, that they are not inconsistent with one another. A few things I want to I want to say about this before we move on. Uh, at the very end, where it talks about science and religion, true science that is honest. True science that doesn't have an agenda, it agrees with the Bible because the Bible uh, isn't telling us a lie like evolution does. The Bible uh, has evidence after evidence of scientific foreknowledge throughout it where the people in these ancient times bring up things that we, that we would think that they wouldn't know, but they did because God told them to write those things down. And when people go out and they try to uh, disprove the Bible, they find that they can't do it. There are individuals, through my studies of preparing these lessons, I read about a man, I don't remember his name, but he uh, tried to disprove the Bible. He, he, he believed in evolution, and he went through the Bible to try to disprove it, and he found himself having to reject evolution and be honest with the Scriptures and, and go with what the Scriptures teach because he realized evolution is a lie, and creation is the truth. And that's, this, and that's why we hope that everyone else will as well. But notice he said here, uh, in the middle of this article, he said anyone willing to accept that the biblical stories are metaphorical. So again, if we can just say, well, you know, Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, um, that's just a metaphor. It didn't really happen that way. Uh, when it says that God did what he did on day one, as we looked at this morning, and what he did on day two, that's just a metaphor. It's just representative of something. And if we look at it like that, well, then it's okay. Then you can also accept evolution. You can say, well, it's just a metaphor. God's using evolution. Well, as I said a moment ago, when do we stop doing that then? When the Bible says Jesus died on the cross, is the cross just a metaphor? Is the shed blood of Christ a metaphor? Is him dying and purchasing his church just a metaphor? Where does it stop? Is the teaching of hell for those that know not God just a metaphor? Well, you see, you can't just say one thing's a metaphor and something else isn't. You have to rightly divide the scriptures. And if we truly believe that there is a creator, we will take a literal interpretation of what is said in Genesis 1, Genesis 2, and everything else the Bible tells us that truly happened, we have to accept that it happened because God said it happened. And if we believe in God, then we're going to believe that it actually happened. And so, and so we do not want to ever find ourselves thinking this way. But here's one example of evolution, how that it opposes God. It says, well, you can believe it and religion if you're willing to compromise your stance on religion. We can't serve two masters, we said this morning. It doesn't work that way. We have to walk a straight and narrow path, and, and getting off that path is what happens if we compromise. Yeah, I found another website I wanted to share some info with you before we get into some scriptures here. And it was a website where it talks about uh, some questions people might have about evolution versus religion. 
And I want to share some of those answers with you as we lay the evidence that evolution uh, is against God. One of the questions is, that some I have is, doesn't evolution contradict religion? This answer says not always. This is from a 1994-1998 book called God and Evolution. Uh, from a website called Top Words that's on the board here. Certainly, it contradicts a literal interpretation of the first chapter of Genesis, but evolution is a scientific principle like gravity or electricity to scientifically test a religious belief. One first must find some empirical test that gives different results depending upon whether the belief is true or false. These results must be predicted beforehand, not pointed to after the fact. Over and over, the Bible reminds us that there is evidence after evidence after evidence that the Bible is true and it is from God. It has been scrutinized for centuries after centuries, and people cannot disprove what is written in this book. On the other hand, however, evolution, we, as we just found out, contradicts a literal interpretation of the first chapter of Genesis. And so if it contradicts the first chapter of Genesis, then it contradicts the second chapter and the third chapter, and it contradicts Exodus, and it contradicts Leviticus, and it contradicts Deuteronomy, and everything that, that the Bible says from there on out. And so this is pretty clear. The not always part, that's just, a, that's just a, a smoke and mirrors. Yes, it contradicts God. But somebody says, well, does evolution contradict creationism? Because again, there are those that say you can mesh the two together. We talked about theistic evolution very briefly this morning. We're going to try to have an entire lesson on that later. Uh, but they say, does evolution uh, contradict creationism? And here's what they say. There are two parts to creationism. Evolution specifically, uh, common descent, that is that we came from a common ancestor, uh, like a monkey or whatever, tells us how life came to where it is, but it does not say why. We answered the question of why this morning, didn't we? That we are here for God. We were created by Him and for Him. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. If the question is whether evolution disproves the basic underlying theme of Genesis, that God created the world and the life in it, the answer is no. Is it now? Evolution cannot say exactly why common descent chooses the past that it did. If the question is whether evolution contradicts a literal interpretation of the first chapter of Genesis as an exact historical account, then it does. And therefore, if it does there, then it always does. It's the same way when it comes to anything. Let, take the science part off and let's think about maybe a doctrinal error. Somebody disagrees with us on how to become a Christian. You show them a scripture and you say, here it shows very plainly, he that believes in his baptized shall be saved. Why do they say? Well, God didn't mean that. That's your interpretation. Now, so here, if you want to believe evolution, God didn't mean what he said in Genesis 1. He didn't really mean that he said, let there be light. That's a metaphor. You can't take it literally. Because if you take the Bible literally, evolution has nothing to stand on. It falls on its face it, because it is a lie. And the Bible is true. This is the main and, and for, uh, rather, yeah, if the question is whether evolution contradicts a literal interpretation of the first chapter of Genesis as an exact historical account, then it does. This is the main and for the most part only point of conflict between those who believe in evolution and creations. I would disagree. There is plenty more that disagrees with the Bible. But even one point that disagrees with the Bible is enough to reject evolution. Young kids, remember that. When your teachers talk to you about evolution, realize they're telling you about a lie. And be prepared. Think, uh, focus on what we're talking about in these lessons. Another question says, by denying creation, are you denying God's power to create? Now, our premise on this point is that evolution denies God. Now, this person answered this question by saying no, but is that true? Again, people can say no, and they try to, and they try to wiggle around what they say is, but pay close attention to what they really say. No, evolution uh, does not deny creation or God's power to create. But he says, because God did not create the world in seven days does not mean that he could. What, what does that mean? That means that he's denied it. Right. He's denying that God created the world in seven days. And so yeah, it contradicts it. What did or did not happen is not an indication of what could or could not have happened. All evidence suggests that evolution is the way things happened, regardless of what could have happened, the evidence would still point to evolution. Do you, author of this, deny that God created everything? Yeah, you do. 
And that's what evolution denies. That's what Darwin taught. That's what Richard Dawkins is teaching. And that's what your biology book that talks about evolution is teaching, that we evolved. And that denies the literal days. Evolution denies that. And you cannot try to hold on to any piece of what this teaches and think that you're pleasing to God. Theistic evolution is as much of an error as full-blown evolution. You cannot uh, deny God's power in any way and expect to be pleasing to God. And so evolution denies God. And so we need to be ready to answer that. We need to always be ready to answer uh, for the reason of the hope that is in us with meekness and fear, 1 Peter 3.15. When it comes to the, to the teaching of evolution, what we find today that is uh, centered around evolution is not only, not only an attack on your belief of, of, of creation, but an attack on the Bible itself, attack on the historical accuracy of the Bible, and that it came from God. And so we need to be prepared to discuss, does God exist or not? There is, there is biblical proof that God exists. The Bible itself it, it is enough proof that God exists when you think about the span of time it took to write the book, the number of people that wrote it, where they were all from, different time periods, and so on. And that's something that we'll discuss more so. But the existence of God, men who believe in evolution will, will say some of the most outlandish things in order to disprove God. I was listening to a, a video about a man who was an evolutionist who debated uh, a, a Church of Christ preacher. And the evolutionist, uh, evidently, from what they were saying about the debate, and his, his way of trying to disprove that God exists was is he brought something with him, some sort of reading material, a newspaper, a book, and he, and he said that God would need to either tell him or the preacher uh, what was on a certain page. And if God didn't tell them what was on that certain page, well, then that means God don't exist. God's not going to bow down to the whims of man. God is the creator. We are the creation. God doesn't follow our orders. We do what the creator says. And we don't need uh, something like that to prove that God exists. We've got his word right here. We've got evidence all around us to prove that there is a creator, a designer, a divine architect. We need to be able to talk about the truth of creation. We need to be able to talk about what we learned about in Genesis, especially, and the things we discussed this morning about how that we know that we were created, and the truth about the flood. You see, one of the things that is connected to, to this idea of evolution is a long period of time. And it needs a long period of time in order for it to work, uh, according to their theory. The Grand Canyon, for instance, is supposedly was formed over uh, millions of years or something along those lines. And so that, and so that again, is supposedly tied into the idea that we've been around for, for like four billion years or whatever. And, and, and yet, if you think about the flood of Noah, you think about something cataclysmic like the flood of Noah happening all at once, it's easy to understand how the Grand Canyon was formed as the waters receded in the flood of Noah. And so they tried to disprove that Noah exists. And of course, they tried to disprove the Bible in general. If, we can if they can take away your belief in the Bible, then it's, it's, it's uh, your soul. Uh, it's open season for your soul. And they can teach you evolution. You can latch on to evolution. You can have a, uh, a, a value of life is diminished. We're on equal terms with animals. And so many other things can come out of that. In Colossians 4, verse 5, the Bible says, Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. If you think about the individual that denies there, there is a God, I'm pretty sure that individual fits in the category of those who are on the outside. And so we need to be ready and know how to answer when, the, when we are questioned about our belief in God. And we need to use wisdom and knowledge from God's Word to do so, so that we'll know how we ought to answer anybody that questions us about our belief in God, that questions us about whether we believe in creation, and why we believe in creation. And that's one of the reasons why we're talking about the idea of evolution or God. Thirdly, our children need to remember their Creator. If we don't want a generation like the one read, out, read about in, in Judges chapter 2, our children need to, Ecclesiastes 12, 1, remember now your Creator in the days of your youth. Now, in the context, I know he talks about the idea of us aging and so on, but that first phrase, that first phrase speaks volumes as to why, as to why we need to remember our Creator. Certainly, we're going to get older in life, but 
So many things in life, uh, trials and troubles and problems in life are avoided by remembering our Creator in our youth so that we, we live lives that are, uh, that are more productive, lives that are uh, less troublesome. We stay out of trouble. We, we don't get into things that maybe shorten our lives uh, and so on. But when we think about evolution, and now all of our kids are being taught evolution, and they're not taught anything about God, they're not remembering their Creator. They need to remember their Creator. Because someday we're all going to stand before our Creator. And if we don't remember our Creator, what's going to happen is you're going to have a generation that doesn't know God. Here's some statistics that are alarming. Now, there's a lot more statistics you can find online, but this is from a Gallup poll as early as, as recent as 2017. And in this poll, it says 38% of Americans say God created man in present form, the lowest in 35 years. So barely a little over a third of this country believe that God created us exactly as we are, according to this poll. And it says the same percent say humans evolved, but God guided the process. And so you already had this, this, this movement towards trying to blend the two together. Instead of fighting and standing our ground, individuals have decided, well, let's budge a little bit, and let, let's, just, let's just try to blend the two together. We'll try to marry the two in somehow. And so we're going to say, yes, God created us, but he, he created the monkey or whatever, and then over the millions of time, millions of years, it evolved. And they point out that less educated Americans more likely to believe in creationism. Why do you suppose that is? Why do you suppose that is? What was it? Was told to Paul, much learning doesn't make thee mad. There comes a point in time when a person gets an education and that is nothing wrong with getting an education. But there are individuals out there that put their secular education on such a high pedestal. And, and what it says uh, that they totally forget their creator. And they get to the point that they think that they're smarter than God. There's a brother I know from uh, Stonefell that used to talk about people that were in various different fields that required a lot of, a lot of study, like say a doctor or a lawyer, and things along those lines, but they would follow um, uh, religions of men uh, from some of the other countries out there. He referred to them as educated fools. When you think about somebody that gets to the point where they think that they're smarter than God, that's what they are. They're an educated fool. Because the fool had said in his heart, there is no God. And that's exactly what we find. Why is it that we have such a low number of people not believing in God and believing in evolution? Because more and more uh, people are being taught evolution. It's out there. And less and less people are being taught about God. This particular site, it had some restrictions on uh, presenting its data, so that's why I don't have everything. But if you go there... There is some really good data that talks about how the percentage of breaks it down. Like, the more people go to church, the more people believe in God. The fewer visits, the, the less often you go to church, the less often you believe in God. Makes sense to me. Makes sense to me. The less I'm reading about creation, uh, the less I'm going to remember my Creator. And we need to remember our Creator. And our children need to remember their Creator. They're being taught to remember Darwin. They're being taught to remember evolution, and we need to fight against that. Here's an article uh, that was as recent as 2015, and it's titled, Finally, There Are More Young Americans Who Believe in Evolution Than Creationism. Now, you can you can read that and tell that that is saying that in a positive light. It's wonderful, according to this writer here, uh, this, this person, uh, Fiona McDonald here. And they say, there's been a long-standing divide between Americans who believe in evolution and those who think God created humans just as they are. But a recent poll has shown that 51% of American adults under the age of 30 now claim to purely believe in secular evolution, which means evolution independent of any divine powers. They're not even, they're not even thinking about theistic evolution. They're... Complete and total uh, atheists, in other words. They're just believing in evolution all, all, all the way. And it says they jumped from 40% back in 2009 when the research began. So more than half of the American population is under the age of 30. That was written in 2015. So some of those individuals, if they were 30 then, they're about 32, 33 now, 34, whatever. Uh, that's a startling number. I don't know exactly how many people that is. But if there's, uh, I, I believe... Uh, if I'm wrong with my math, David Remy can correct me here, but if there's 300 million people, uh, I believe that would make about 50 million people are uh, in this category. 
Maybe I'm a little bit wrong on that. I believe that's about right. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. That's staggering. That we could have that large chunk of our population that are uh, atheistic, that don't believe in God, and that uh, believe in evolution instead. And why is it such a large number? What's happened? What's happened is, is people have shifted their, their stance. And the outcry against evolution and, and, and standing up for creation has dropped. And, and the outcry for evolution has gone up. The, the stance for the truth of what really happened has gone down, and we need to reverse that course. Our children need to be reminded about their creator. Well, what's going to happen is, is what it said in Judges chapter 2. Now, notice that a little bit closer than that. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation was after them, who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. When we have a generation that has been taught evolution from the time they were a child to now they're in their 30s, they're not going to know about God. They're going to know about Darwin. They're going to know about uh, individuals that came after Darwin. And they're not going to know what God did for them because they're not interested in creation. And then the children of Israel did evil on the side of the Lord and served the Baals. Now, we don't have uh, literal statues out there for people to serve today. But when we, when individuals forget God, what they find, and they latch on evolution, what they're doing is they're serving Darwin. They're serving Richard Dawkins. They're serving uh, these man-made beliefs that say we came from a monkey. And that becomes their God, and they serve themselves. They forsake the Lord, the God of their fathers, he says here, who brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they followed other gods from the gods of the people who were all around them. And they bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. When we decide that there is no God, and that we are on equal, feet, on equal standing with animals, well, then that means humanistic beliefs take over. Uh, it's the survival of the fittest from a humanistic standpoint. I'm going to worry about me. And I'm not going to worry about you. And, and I'm going to focus on me. And I'm not going to worry about what I do, how it affects you, how it affects anyone. And, the, and therefore, I'm bowing down to self. I'm bowing down to things of this world. And what does that do? That provokes the Lord to anger. And so these are the end results of, of a generation that, that grows up not knowing about God. A generation that is indoctrinated with evolutionary teaching, they don't have an interest in God. Uh, their focus is on self, as I said. They're committing evil on the side of the Lord. They're following Darwin, Dawkins, and others, as I said. And what they have done is they've exchanged the truth of creation for the lie of evolution. And that's precisely what they've done. And as I said in Psalm 14.1, the Bible says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. It's easy uh, if you just be honest with yourself, if you're honest with the scriptures, if you're honest with what God has created to, to realize and accept that there is a creator. Mm -hmm. Nothing doesn't come from chance. This morning we talked a little bit, just a little snippet about the Big Bang, how that there was supposedly things were just compacted together. There was a big explosion, and now, now here, we're, here we are where we are. When's the last time you, uh, you went shopping for a car and decided to go to the junkyard and throw a stick of dynamite in the junkyard and hope, hope that a really nice car came out of that? I don't remember the last time. I mean, if you do that, then, then you're, you might want to go see a doctor. It don't work. You can't get something uh, like that. It, God created us. Right. There's, no, there's no explosion and then things just so happen to randomly fall into place. As complex as we are, that we just simply evolved over time. Hopefully we'll see that as we go on. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9 says that when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he shall be punished with everlasting destruction for the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. Who? Those that know not God. Those that take God out of the picture, and, and, and if we take God out of the picture and put evolution in, in its place, then we raise up a generation that does not know God. There is vengeance. It's going to come upon them uh, for going down that route. Now finally, we want to talk about evolution or God because these individuals who are teaching evolution, well, they have a soul. We want them to repent. We want them to know the truth. We want to know with them to reject this lie that they're teaching and accept the truth that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In Titus 1, 9 through 11, the Bible says, Holding fast the faithful word that has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. 
To say that God did not create the world in six days is a contradiction. And we need to exhort those and we need to convict those that, that teach those things and what the truth is so they can repent. Because they are like these that he mentions here. There are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers. When somebody says, you're a cousin of, what was it this morning, monkeys and kangaroos, they're deceiving you. They're, they're, they're idle talking, empty, vain, dangerous talk, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for uh, dishonest gain. The evolutionists, some of them may truly believe it with all their heart and don't have ulterior motives to make gain, but men throughout, but others are using this as a way to make gain. They're writing books about it. They're, they're giving speeches about it. They're, they're putting that message out there and they're leading people away from God. And so these individuals are subverting whole households when they teach our children about evolution. We don't teach them about creation. We need to prepare them. 2 Timothy 2, verse 24 to 26 says, And the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient. This is going to require patience when we talk to individuals who don't believe there's a God. And we need to be able to teach them, yes, there is a God, and that evolution is a lie. In humility, correcting those who are in opposition, I believe evolution would fit in that category, that it is in opposition to the Scriptures, in opposition that there is a God. That if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth, we want the evolutionists to know the truth. We want men like Richard Dawkins who don't believe in, believe in God to renounce that atheistic belief and accept the gospel and become a Christian. Men like the Apostle Paul who rejected God was given an opportunity and therefore God wants God uses that as, as an example to show that anybody can come to God. Anybody can reject evolution and atheism and come to the Lord because what they're doing when they're teaching evolution is what it says in verse 26. They're doing the will of the devil. They're in his snare. And we want the evolution to, evolutionists to repent, to come to the truth, to escape from that snare and to know they're going to be judged for what they're teaching. They're going to be judged for leading so many people down the path of destruction. And that path of destruction is called evolution. There's no hope in evolution. There's no hope for your soul in evolution. I know this lesson has been more toward, towards those of us who are Christians than others. As I said this morning, if you, if you believe any bit of evolution and you're rejecting any bit of God, or if, you, if you're, you're guilty of the whole, of just rejecting the entire Bible. And if you believe in God, but you're not willing to obey His Word, you're just as guilty as the atheist who says there is no God. You know, James tells us something interesting about the devil, doesn't he? The devils believe and tremble. The devils believe there's God. And so, if you believe there's a God, do something about it. Come to the Lord. Because we, as we talked about this morning in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, if this is all we have, if this is all we have, we're at all we have most miserable. And so, if it, evolution doesn't give us any hope, what, what do we need to do? We need to come to the Lord. Peter said in 1 Peter 4, 19, Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to Him in doing good as a faithful Creator. Our Creator is faithful. He will grant us a home in heaven if we serve Him in this life. Die in the Lord. We'll, go to, we'll be raised in the Lord and we'll come in heaven. <coughs> Are you not a Christian? Are someone's not a Christian? Do you believe in God? Well, then take the next step. Mm -hmm. Repent of your sins. Say God's forgiveness. Uh, repent of your sins, confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. If you're not a Christian, repent and see God's forgiveness to you. If you, I messed that up. If you are a Christian, and you follow the way, repent. See God's forgiveness to you. We'll pray with you for you. If you're not a Christian, first you need to repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins next to you. If you're here this evening, we can help in any way. Let it be known as a stand in the name, an invitation song. I've wondered.